Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's good to be with you. Today, you're a New York Times bestselling author, award-winning journalist, and then also the executive director of the Flow Research Collective, um, and also one of the world's leading experts on human performance. But before we go into all that, I want to take it back for a moment um, to ask you about what led to your interest in this field. Because from what I've read, you had a background in uh, in English and creative writing. So I'm just curious how you uh, how you got to where you are today. It's worse than that. I'm actually trained as an undergraduate as a poet. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I started my career coming. I'm trained as a poet and a, a, an undergraduate. I studied uh, uh, fiction writing at Johns Hopkins for graduate school. And I came out of graduate school and slipped very quickly into journalism. Uh, and the 90s were an amazing time to be a journalist. And I'm in general a very curious person and I have no problem following an idea off the edge of the world, which is sort of the job of a journalist, right? So it was, I was really well suited for this particular thing. And I, w I was obsessed with a couple of things back then um, that have sort of ended up defining a large chunk of my career. The first was uh, neuroscience and more specifically what used to be called and is no longer called behavioral neuroscience. So the nineties was when we went from sort of understanding what the architectures of the brain and a little bit of how it works to how that starts to produce behavior. So things like emotions and consciousness and altered states of consciousness, which is where I was uh, also interested, um, started becoming serious topics for the very first time. And <clears throat> I love the brain because it gave us a mechanistic view and I had a peak performance interest and psychology is phenomenal, but it's metaphorical. And if you really want things that are reliable, repeatable, work for you, work for everybody, you want mechanisms. So you want neurobiology. So that's sort of the scene setting. And at the same time, I was an action sport athlete and I was obsessed with action sports. And um, the 90s, if you know anything about action sports, and I was reporting on, on action sports, uh, is referred to in like surfing, skiing, rock climbing, snowboarding across the boards as the so-called era of impossible, more impossible feats. Uh, things that had never been done and were really believed were never going to be done, got accomplished than ever before. And I was living in these communities. I had a front row seat. I always said it's a very different thing. You know, you see somebody, you know, do something impossible, a skier jump off a hundred foot cliff on a screen. It's one thing and it looks astounding, but like you go drinking with your friends on a Friday night, you wake up on Saturday morning, go into the mountains and your friend does something for that for all of recorded history, nobody's ever done and isn't supposed to be possible. And that alone like caught my attention, like what the hell is going on? How is this going on? Why is this going on? I already sort of knew I wanted to use the tools in neuroscience to decode it. But what really grabbed my attention, I think, was the beginning of what turned into a lifelong passion was most of the people I knew were not paradigms of peak performance. In fact, they were the exact opposite. They had shitty childhoods. They came from broken homes. A lot of the people I knew, they had very little money. They had very little education. There was a lot of risk taking and substance abuse. And, you know, the community I was living in, uh, in what is today Palisades Tahoe, what was then Squaw Valley, this was a punk rock mecca. Right. Like action sports was a punk rock sub subculture. And, and this was a and more of the punk rockers and action sports ended up in Squaw Valley than in, say, Jackson Hole or British Columbia or some of those other locales. And so this was a puzzle. Right. Everything we know about peak performance, at least sort of with the old story was genetics. Like you got to have good genes. You got to have a good environment. You got to have a good childhood. You got to have the right education. You better have the right parents and you better, you know, walk the straight and narrow and put your 10,000 hours in and don't do drugs and don't take on. And none of that was in the community I was looking at. And I, you know, so on top of the, like, how is this happening? Holy crap. It's amazing. Was this really sort of foundational psychological, sociological puzzle of like, what was allowing these incredibly so-called disadvantaged folks to, you know, a call and, and on top of it, it was a wildly neurodivergent community is how you could describe it. A lot of ADHD, right? Also. So like, here's a, here's a community also that's not supposed to do well for those reasons. They're doing phenomenally well. And I, like, why is this happening? And I will tell you as a final detail, because this explains almost everything else that happened afterwards, 
if you're not a professional athlete and you spend all your time chasing professional athletes like around mountains and across oceans, you are going to break things. And I broke a lot of things. And after somewhere between my 60th and my 70th broken bone, I realized that like this was really cool, but I needed to stop trying to chase professional athletes around mountains full time because I was going to die. And I took this question of what does it take to accomplish the impossible into other domains. I looked in business and technology and science and art and essentially wrote books about what I discovered. So you can go through, you know, all 14 of my books and they're all sort of aimed at a slice of the population that accomplished the impossible and tries to decode why that happened. Across the board, if you had to you know, attribute, let's say, a percentage, how much of what somebody achieves in terms of human performance are they born with versus how much of it could be developed in terms of their potential? There are all sorts of so-called natural advantages. I should also like to point out that every one of the natural advantages comes with a built-in disadvantage, right? Let's say you have a very fast brain. One of the reasons that happens, processing speed is super fast, is norepinephrine. That's fantastic for processing speed, but norepinephrine is essentially anxiety and fear. So you've got a really fast brain, but you're crazy neurotic. That's a common pairing. But here's what I'll tell you at a macro level. I, more than probably anybody else alive, have spent my career interviewing people who accomplished the impossible, being in the room when the impossible became possible as often as possible. And I will tell you that none of the people who accomplished them started out extraordinary. They started out unbelievably ordinary. And the path to impossible, let's back up and just say two things. One, what we call peak performance is really nothing more than getting our biology to work for us rather than against us. We all share a lot of overlap in biology. We can all use the system the way it was designed to work. Let's just talk cognitive peak performance. When you talk about the, the biology of cognitive peak performance, there's four categories of skills. There's a category that sits under the heading of motivation, another under the heading of learning, a third under the heading of creativity, and a final one under the heading of flow, which is the technical term for the optimal state of consciousness. We feel our best and we perform our best. And if you're not familiar with the term or what I'm talking about, it's any of those moments of rapt attention and total absorption, those in the zone moments, you get so fixated, so focused on what you're doing, everything else just starts to disappear and melt away. And all aspects of performance, mental and physical, tend to go through the roof. We call that flow. I always sort of paint this picture together if everybody's like, why those four categories? In any situation, motivation gets you into the game. Learning allows you to continue to play. Creativity is how you steer, especially when you're going after sort of impossible challenges where like, how the hell do I get there, right? And these could be business challenges, like how the hell do we settle this case? Or these could be, you know, how do I run a sub four mile, it's the same kind of problem. And flow is how we turbo boost the results beyond all sort of recognition and, you know, and normal expectation. As we talk about impossible, because I know, I know we'll use this with this word a lot, um, you've differentiated impossible with a capital I from impossible with a lowercase I. So if you could speak to that. We've been talking with the athletes. That was impossible with a capital I, right? This stuff had never been done before and suddenly it was being done. Nobody sets out to accomplish capital I impossible. I've met very few people that do. Usually what they do is they go after small I impossible, which is those things that we think are impossible for ourselves, right? Rising out of poverty, overcoming trauma, being an entrepreneur, starting a business. Um, these are all versions of small I impossible. Take an ordinary person, put them on a path to use the tools of peak performance to accomplish capital I impossible. And you, as soon as you do one, Right? Anybody who's had a little bit of success knows this. You're like, oh shit, I did that. What else can I do? And you go after another and you go after another. And what else can I do? And what else could I do? And over time, this is how you end up accomplishing capital I impossible. It's just something that happens on the path. It's like you go into the back country with, with folks every now and again, somebody's like, oh yeah, today's the day I'm going to jump this or do this. But often they're just doing what they do and like impossible is what happens along the way. So in your book, The Art of Impossible, you talk a lot about goals. Uh, and I know you hinted at this earlier, but you note that like fear and goals are the basic building blocks of our reality. And, and I'm curious about the fear part, because whenever you spoke about peak performers, fear always seemed to serve as like a directional arrow. A little bit of fear, a little bit of the neurochemical norepinephrine, a little bit of the neurochemical cortisol is great. It amplifies learning. It drives attention, it does a lot. 
too much and you have a really pro big problem, it'll block flow, for example, blocks creativity, um, blocks performance, is a problem for memory and so forth. Usually what happens in peak performance is you push on your skills to the utmost. That tends to drop you into flow. You get to do more and go farther than you've gone before. With peak performers, they start to figure out that while well, too much fear is problematic and so you have to do a lot of emotional regulation work. It's why you see so much meditation, exercise, gratitude. These are all practices that retune the nervous system and lower anxiety. One of the reasons they want to do that is the brain is an energy hog, uses 25% of our energy, right? But it's 2% of our body mass. Um, it's got a fixed energy budget also. And we spend most of that budget on focus, right? That's a lot. Paying attention is a lot of that budget. So anytime you get focus for free, it's a big deal. It's a big energy savings. Fear, if you're not overwhelmed by it, it's fantastic. It gives you focus for free. So I, I'll give you just a personal example of what this looks like in the real world. In my book, Stealing Fire, that was a, you can't tell because I, I hope because I did my job, but it was an incredibly information dense book. Most sentences are like one, uh, one fact per sentence. If you're reading a really factually dense science magazine like Wired, you can get two or three sometimes. We had in Stealing Fire sometimes three to four facts per sentence. This is a really complicated writing challenge, communication challenge. And I had to study, for example, uh, a science writer by the name of Steven Pinker, who's at Harvard, who uh, he's funny. Right? He's, he's actually a, f a very talented, funny writer, but he writes very information dense sentences. So I had to like, I did what I called like the pinker edit on my writing to figure out how to tell that story effectively. And it scared me because I'd never done anything quite like that. I, I like to set those sort of challenges inside the book because um, a book is a long slog, man. Two, three, four years. And my books, some of my books, you know, the research will span decades. After that long, you got to sometimes do extra things to, to hold attention. Um, fear is one of them. And I've seen this, you know, with all top performers. Um, and, you know, uh, it's very common in athletics. But I think, you know, you so see it in entrepreneurship, too. This is interesting because I'm I'm in the process of finishing my second book. And I was going to ask you because you've put out fiction books, nonfiction books, you've been so consistent in, in publishing such high quality. What's the secret to, to just the consistency of, of publishing at a, at a high quality? Because, you know, with many researchers and authors, you see such gaps, right? Sometimes it's, you know, a decade, maybe even more. But, you know, yours, you're, you're coming out with something every year, every other year. And it's, you know, so information rich. I'm trained as a new journalist, like a long form new journalist. And if you look at the new journalists, they tend to produce a book every year or two years. Um, that tends to be a pattern. Like I'm used to working at speed. Second thing you should know is that um, I don't have much of a social life. I wake up at four o'clock in the morning and I work till 6 p.m. Um, most every day, right? Um, I don't, I, like I ski a ton and I hike around the back country with my dogs. I'm out if I could do a bunch of stuff like that, but like I don't, Go on vacations. I work very differently than a lot of people. And you also have to remember that one, two, three, four of my books were written with um, co-writers. And one of the reasons you write with co-writers is because they bring a bunch of the research to the table. The last thing is you know, the Flow Research Collective is, um, I think at this point, one of the, we're the largest of the largest neuroscience-based peak performance training company in the world. Like we work in 130 countries and it's a, it's a, so there's a lot, I get to work with top psychologists and top neuroscientists, um, all the time. And a lot of them, and I try to hire people with deep expertises in sort of gaps in my knowledge where like, I know there's a gap and I, you know, I have some knowledge, but I need, you know, we need to step it up a notch and I tend to find, you know, who's the best here. Okay. Let's try to bring them in and work with them there. And if we can't hire them, we partner with them. So 
I've got a superstar team that I get to work with on a lot of the peak performance research. And that team, you know, I do research with Dr. Andrew Newberg, you know, now he's been my mentor, you know, one of my first mentors in neuroscience since the late nineties, when I really started doing this work in earnest. So some of these are really long relationships. Now we, you know, get to do experiments together. So whenever the topic comes up of talking about just, you know, whether it's work-life balance or, or, or working, to, you know, insane hours, there's always going to be somebody listening who's, who's wondering, that's great, but is that person happy? And I, I know in your book, you present the findings from, I believe it was Angela Duckworth. She did a study uh, basically finding a clear link between grittiness and the level of happiness that people pursue, uh, if you could speak to that. It is worth pointing out that grit is the very last motivator you want to reach for. Grit is what we use when all the motivators are on app. There's six major motivators that, you, that we work with in peak performance, and if you get them all pointed in the same way and all augmented by proper goal setting, you get a tremendous amount of push going forward. Um, and some of those motivators are broken into what psychologists talk about as levels of happiness. And there's just there's basic happiness. How do you feel right here, right now? And the truth of the matter is there's not a whole lot you can do about that. Um, we are born with emotional set points. We've got a low point and a high point, and most of our lives are lived in between. You can move the set points a little bit. Regular access to flow can slide you up. Uh, death of a child or chronic unemployment can slide you down. Other than that, they tend to be pretty fixed. Um, and they're set up usually by time we're 11 or 12, and we don't really know entirely why, what is doing that yet, but we just know it, it, it sort of happens. And that's happiness. As Dan Harris pointed out, uh, you can be about 10% happier. And we talked about some of the tools, gratitude lists, mindfulness, regular exercise. There are other things, but like those are the tools that lower anxiety and, and, and increase happiness and emotional regulation and some other things. The next level up is what is called enjoyment. And this is essentially a high flow lifestyle but it also means that the thing that is driving you into flow so frequently aligns with your goals. So I have a lot of ski goals because I'm a skier and I live in the mountains. I ski a lot, but I also use the ski mountain as my laboratory for flow studies. Um, right. It's my personal laboratory and it has been for 30 years. So there's like those motivations start to fold together. And then I get you get to the top level of motivation, happiness, which is um, purpose is how we talk about it now. And all that means is that it's what I just described. It's the activity that is aligned with my goals. Skiing uh, is further aligned with one of my big sort of missions in life. And, and one of my big missions is obviously to advance flow science and research and training. Um, so very, it's all very nestled. And as a result, I mean, first of all, to return to an earlier topic, when you're passionate, when you're on purpose, you get a lot of focus for free, right? I don't have to worry about paying attention. It sort of happens automatically. Um, and you get, you know, extra boosts in learning and memory and, and, and all kinds of uh, stuff along the way uh, as a result of that. So you, t you this is some of what I meant earlier when you said you get the biology working for you rather than against you just go farther, faster with a lot less fuss. So we had Matt Frazier uh, on the podcast. So like five time CrossFit games champion, like world's fittest man. And when we were talking and I, and I asked him about kind of the process that he went through in training, uh, he said that he didn't enjoy it. He, he didn't actually enjoy any of the training, but he liked the winning. And I'm curious, how important is it to enjoy the process versus enjoying the outcome? So that's pretty rare, right? Um, as Angela Duckworth pointed out, you know, but like the grittier you are, the more everything's aligned with everything. Like it's hard to believe that, um, especially I'm a gym rat and a, like an exercise junkie and, um, and have been for decades and decades and decades. And like eat the harder the workout, the more like, you drop in, you don't like it, but you love it at the same time. I always say that peak performance is not about how things feel. Peak performance is about what you do despite the feelings. As we talked about earlier, goals are important for peak performance. The research shows you need three levels of goals, mission level goals. I want to be a great author, high heart goals. That's I want to write a book on law. I want to write a book on flow. I want to go to uh, college and learn how to write and 
general. I want to try to become a journalist to figure out how to write professionally. I want to become a podcaster to figure out how to interview people, whatever it is, right? Those are the big steps, three to five year steps you've got to take to achieve your mission. And then you've got daily clear goals, right? This is just your action plan, your to-do list for the day. One of the secrets, especially to clear goals, um, is if you want to get the biggest boost from them, they have to be process goals. They can't be outcome goals. So as a writer, my process goal is I want to write 500 words today in my new book. If it's really the front end of a book and I don't even actually know what I'm writing about yet, it's like I want to write 500 words in a new book and I want when I'm done, when the reader's done reading them, I want them to feel excitement or curiosity or fear. Or whatever, you know what I mean? I, like It's very clear. Um, and the emphasis, by the way, should both on process goals and on clear goals. Clear goals sort of tell the brain where to focus. Hey, put your attention on this. And when you're done with this, put your attention on this. And so it amplifies focus. Anything that amplifies focus will also in turn amplify flow. Uh, so clear goals will really help you focus. They help you stay on target. They also end up downstream amplifying flow. But if you're setting them properly, they got to be process goals. They can't be, I'm going to write 500 words and it's going to win me a Pulitzer right? Or going to impress my mom. I will say I wor I've worked with the same editor uh, for years. And I will say one every now and again, I do have I do set outcome goals, which is I want to crack him up. His name is Michael as well. And sometimes I'll, a lot of things in the devil's dictionary, for example, that are hysterically funny, started out as like, you know, I edit with Michael a couple times a week, it's long, it's hard if I can make him laugh a couple times along the way, it's better for all of us. And so things start out as jokes to get Michael laughing. Um, and if he laughs really hard, they tend to stay in the book. We had James Lawrence on the podcast. So he's known as like Iron Cowboys, then 100 Iron Man triathlons in 100 you know, consecutive days. And when I was speaking with him, I asked him, I was like, well, did you, you know, did you enjoy that? And he, and he said to me very clearly, he's like, no, I quit every race. During every race, he would say, this is the last race that I'm running. And, and I've spoken to people, whether it's their, uh, they're doing a big initiative, let's say they're working on a book, they're saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this thing, it's my last book, or it's something, you know, some big target they set in their business and they say, after this, I'm done. But then something interesting happens when they do finish, and whether they get PTSD or whether they have amnesia or they somehow forget all that pain and struggle, but then they go and do it again. So I'm just curious what that is. People don't often realize that forgetting is a key neurobiological skill. If we couldn't forget, we would have really significant problems. Um, and we have the endocannabinoid system, which is sort of a second immune system. It's very, uh, it, seems, it seems to drive most of the stress responses, um, good and bad, right? Calm you down or fire you up uh, both ways. Um, often sort of serves that can help, you know, to the endocannabinoid system, that's the same system that uh, THC works with. And people who smoke pot know that you can forget things. And that's the that's like that system at work. Um, so some of that is that, right? This was the something I was going to mention earlier, and I, and I skipped it, which is Stuart Brand, Brand once said, and I agree with him that the only sustainable happiness and happiness, remember that first tier on the levels of happiness, uh, is the satisfaction of a job well done. Yep. And I think there's a lot to that. Um, we are goal directed machines. And when we accomplish high, hard goals, those victories are, you know, watch anybody, listen to anybody talk about what it takes to win the Super Bowl and then talk to them, you know what I mean? Like talk to them after they've won the Super Bowl kind of thing. Um, and I think sometimes we love those awful that the awfulness of it, you know what I mean? Like um, those super gritty days where you have to really just push yourself and push yourself and you're exhausted when it's done. There's a vict, as long as you, you know, there's problems with burnout and at the Flow Research Collective, you know, I would say 60% of the people we train are burned out C-suite executives. Um, so uh, we deal with how this can go wrong a lot, right? If you're, if you're working that hard without regular access to flow, that's a recipe for burnout, for sure. Um, there are a couple other things that will, you know, sort of guarantee burnout, but that's one of them. Were there certain habits that you either adopted or even eliminated through this experience of even, you know, even writing the book and doing all this research? You're looking at a th the sort of 30, the answer is yes, there's a ton of stuff. One random example that 
it's just you're looking for something deep. But um, years ago, when I was breaking lots of bones, Laird Hamilton, the big wave surfer, sat me down and said, Stephen, I, I know this is obvious, and I was really young, and young athletes don't get this. It's like, look, there's strength, there's stamina, and there's flexibility, and if you don't train all three, one of them is going to break you. And I had, I wasn't training flexibility. And as soon as I started doing yoga way back in the nineties, when I was like the only man in yoga classes for a good decade. Right. Um, and, uh, um, it really like I stopped breaking bones uh, unless I did something catastrophically stupid. That's one sort of random example. The latest one has been that I stopped, I shifted from doing focus meditation, um, which I had done for years. Uh, both for anxiety and for focus and, and, and a bunch of other stuff, um, emotional regulation to using uh, loving kindness meditation, which is a, a kind of, it came out of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Richie Davidson, the University of Wisconsin did extensive research on it, but I found it um, the for helping you unearth habitual patterns of behavior that are kind of invisible it's the most effective tool I've ever seen, which is why I like, I I've been meditating for 30 years and sort of started playing with this a couple of years ago. And just like it, my, I suddenly was like, why did it, I, it always felt so kind of silly to me. Like, this is just not for me. I, you know, it's loving kindness meditation is essentially praying for people. Right. Like, and I wasn't raised in, in, in that kind of uh, environment. So like that was a very foreign thing for me, but it's, it works unbelievably well and the neuroscience of why it works unbelievably well has become a huge topic of investigation. Brain takes in a ton of information every second, right? And it, it's got to figure out what's important, what's not important. So what, should, what do I pay attention to? One of the things that tells us what to pay attention to do is what psychologists call our sphere of caring, right? The, the, like, is it the pe our friends, our family, maybe it's, you know, our dogs, our, you know, our pets, our, you know, our town, our, whatever it is, we have a sphere of caring. And um, empathy, by the way, is what shrinks it and widens it. That's how we move it in and out. But when something sits inside your sphere of caring, we pay attention to it. Your brain says, oh, this is, you know, we care about this. Give us more information. And you end up with uh, more information coming in. And that sort of becomes one of the bases for this. So like empathy is sort of a secret weapon in that, like if you can expand empathy, it expands multi-perspectival thinking and all takes place in a part of, a part of your brain called the temporal parallel junction that's right here that just does perspective taking, right? Like what angle are you looking at a problem from? But part of that solution is empathy, right? Like what do you care about? And then your brain says, okay, you're going to get this information and get slightly different information. Um, and you got to remember, it's like your tiny, tiny micro bits. Attention is 126 bits. That's all you can focus on at any one time. It's this tiny slice of the millions of bits of information that come in every second. We see 126 bits. We couldn't do this podcast without mentioning your latest book, The, the Devil's Dictionary. And, and I want to ask you about this in terms of like how you go from, let's say, a nonfiction book like the one we were talking about to really a fiction book, which Devil's Dictionary being the follow up to The Last Tango in, in Cyberspace. I'm curious as to really kind of the goal of this approach, because this book is incredibly interesting. It's you know, raising questions around how far we should take genetic engineering and CRISPR and should we you know tinker with life itself and so on. And I'm curious why you present it in, in the method of like a sci fi thriller. Right. As, a, as opposed to another format. Whenever the impossible becomes possible, you see people using flow and peak performance. You also see people harnessing disruptive technology, accelerating disruptive technology. Right. So half of my books are on accelerating disruptive technology and how people use that tech to solve uh, the impossible. And in sort of I, I always say I'm a reporter, not a futurist. And I was reporting the book that became future is faster than you think. And my co-writer, Peter Diamandis, wanted to look into the future. Okay, let's tell people what it's going to be like when all these accelerating technologies start coming together in 2030 or 2040. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, that's not what I do. I don't, like, guys are futurists and gals are futurists, right? That's a job. It's not my job. I don't know how to do that. But I'm a trained as a storyteller. And so what I did is I put all those technologies together into a world, spun the world 20 years into the future, and then set a story there. And that was Last Tango. I wrote Last Tango while writing uh, 
the future is faster because um, I was trying to like hold on to this world that I had to describe in a nonfiction book and I couldn't. Um, but I could put it into a fiction and set a story there and it also allowed me to explore um, you know, some of the other th some of the other ideas. I can put together peak performance ideas with technology ideas with a bunch of other stuff that I'm interested in and explore it, you know, in fiction in ways it's harder to do in nonfiction. I always say that, like, I could have written a nonfiction version of, of Devil's Dictionary, for example, that explores all the same. There's a bunch of environmental ideas in there and technological ideas. And it would have taken, um, for example, the genetic engineering stuff, right? Like, I'm asking really hard, complicated questions about genetic engineering in that book. And yet, if the actual, like, if there's 10 pages of genetic engineering in the book, maybe seven total, that would be a lot, I would think. So like something about fiction allows you to like do things with metaphor and words and storytelling uh, and reader emotions in a sense that allows you to like skip over, right? If I had to make the genetics argument out of facts that I make in the Devil's Dictionary, it's like 80 pages long and you're bored. Nobody, one of the things I learned writing about nonfiction and science, nobody likes reading about genetics. Unless the book itself is about genetics, people fucking hate reading about genetics. I don't know why. Genetics and history bug people. Unless the book is specifically history or genetics, um, evolution is the other one. Those three subjects seem to really bother readers unless their book is on that particular topic. So fiction allows me to do stuff that I can't normally do. And when presenting this future, it seems like you have a very optimistic view of the future. So things like climate change, mass extinction, a lot of challenges that we face, you you believe we're going to figure these things out. These crises will be averted. So when, when you're presenting this future, it's like, you know, whether it's entrepreneurs have figured it out or someone's figured it out, maybe it's you know, through working even with Peter, but you, you believe we're going to get through it. Well, I believe that we have the technology to solve those challenges. So I did create a world in Devil's Dictionary where climate change and species die off had been solved. And the question really at the heart of that book is what kind of changes in society, right? Whether it's technological, cultural, psychological at an individual level, right? Have to happen for us to solve those challenges. One of the things that we know out of peak performance literature and most people just know out of common sense, if you can't imagine the future, you can't create it. Like, the future, right, whatever it is that we imagine, that's got to be the first step towards creating it. So if we can't imagine a world where climate change isn't solved, species die off isn't solved, we'll never get there. So I wanted to give us a, a target. Let's imagine the world. But I also wanted to be, you know, again, I'm, I'm more of a journalist than a futurist. So I'm not really a utopian by nature. I wanted to create a world that where there were real challenges, and real, but they were the challenges that arose because downstream from solving these problems. Um, and that was what I was sort of looking at, um, which was fun, um, super fun. So, so Stephen, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast is a question I ask every guest at the end of every episode. And I think certainly as, as someone who's quite literally your work is, is tied to changing the game, what does being a game changer mean to you? The work I do at Flow, at the Flow Research Collective, we always say that like our interest is in like paradigm shifting. Nothing is ever the same again. Breakthroughs, right? That tends to be where the where Flow leads. If you can learn to cultivate Flow and really deploy it in your life on a regular basis, that paradigm. So I would think, you know, in a sense, a game changer is something of a little bit of a Flow master. I don't know how you could do one without the other.